Hi, sorry, you tech. My name is Erin Schachter and I'm the National Director of Development at the Learning Partnership. And I am so excited that you are joining us today for our first ever virtual breakout session on healthcare. We heard loudly and clearly that healthcare is one of the most in demand experiences on Take Our Kids to Work Day. And this year, we are bringing you an opportunity to see and visit the Ottawa Hospital. We wanted to be sure that you had the opportunity to see one of Canada's top hospitals up close and personally. You're going to get a tour of their skills and simulation center. It's one of the busiest and most diverse centers of its kind in North America. And make sure you take the, pay close attention and keep track of those questions because you'll have a chance to ask them after this tour to Dr. Vicky LeBlanc and Stephanie Jones who can ask, answer them there. Enjoy the tour. Hi, welcome to the University of Ottawa Skills and Simulation Centre. We're very proud to say that we are one of Canada's largest and busiest simulation programs. In 2017 alone, we welcomed 17,000 learners to the center. 17,000? 17, 17,536, actually. But who's counting? We provide training to all medical students and residents enrolled at the University of Ottawa, as well as to the staff of the Ottawa Hospital. We also have a very strong scholarship focus at the UOSSC. We have a one-year medical education fellowship with the possibility of specializing in simulation-based education. And our FACE program, which is a half day a week for a year, covers all aspects of becoming a simulation educator. And many of our graduates have gone on to be leaders of simulation programs across Canada. At the postgraduate level, all specialties use the Centre to provide training to their residents. And we're really proud of the innovative education and training that goes on here. If you can't be here to see it firsthand, then let us show you around virtually. This training includes part task trainers for clinical skills, including some virtual reality simulations, mannequin based simulations in realistic clinical environments for crisis management and team training, standardized patients for interpersonal skills training, in situ training, where we bring the simulation to the clinical setting so that teams can train together where they work. Simulated models and cadaver labs that allow us to recreate just about any aspect of the human anatomy. Please visit the University of Ottawa Skills and Simulation Centre online at uossc.ca and don't forget to follow us on Twitter at uossc underscore CCSUO. Thank you. So hi everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Vicky LeBlanc. You saw me in the video and I'm joining you from, from home in Ottawa today. I'm the director of the University of Ottawa Skills and Simulation Centre. And hi everyone. My name is Stephanie Jones and I'm the acting manager of the USSC. We're thrilled to talk to you today about healthcare simulation field um, and answer any questions that you may have about the University of Ottawa Skills and Simulation Centre and healthcare simulation in general. Et pour les francophones dans le groupe, euh, nous sommes aussi ravis aujourd'hui de répondre à vos questions euh, à propos du domaine de la simulation euh, puis du centre de simulation euh, dans le domaine de la santé. Thank you so much, Dr. LeBlanc and Stephanie, for being here. And thank you so much to all of our attendees. We see you via these awesome questions that are already pouring in. So thank you for your curiosity and interest. 
So to kick us off, I'm wondering um, if you can tell us a bit more about what the relationship is between simulation and healthcare. Yeah, so I, I'm happy to talk about that one. So the, the key thing that we have in simulation is practice, right? So it doesn't matter what we do in any skills that we want. The more we practice it, the more we're going to be better at it. Um, and so we apply that idea to the idea of healthcare, right? So that the first time that, you know, a nurse is going to take some blood for you, the first time that somebody does a suture um, or they, they do some of those procedures that are kind of more scary or perhaps more complex, you don't want it the first time to be, as we say, on me or my children or my parents. And so what we do in the simulation center is people able to train those things. They're gonna practice doing sutures to cut, to kind of sew up cuts on a skin pad, but they'll even do something in terms of, we recreate a big trauma bay and you have a whole team that has to learn how to work together when things are chaotic and you don't have a lot of time. And so the role is that people will know the skills by the time that they have to do it on us. And we also work at the level of the system, right? So if we're building new eMERGE departments, we're building new ICUs, we're building new hospitals, we work with the architects and the teams to say, well, how do we set up this space? And if we have it set up this way, where are people gonna be hitting into each other? Or where is it that they're not gonna be able to get the things that they need? So we also kind of do it at the level of a, of a system. That's reassuring to hear. And it's also <laughs> so interesting about the choreography behind the scenes and the teamwork and collaboration. Um, I'm wondering, Stephanie, can you tell us a bit more about the types of careers that exist within a simulation field? Sure, so um, simulation is fairly up and coming, um, especially in the last 10 years, I would say. Um, I can speak to our simulation center and we're led by our um, director, Dr. LeBlanc, as well as our medical director, Dr. Glenn Posner. Um, we, I'll let um, Dr. LeBlanc talk a little bit about simulation educators as well as the director positions after. Um, we do also have a manager and the manager takes care of HR, facilities, budgets, contracts, those types of um, logistical things. Uh, we have a coordinator who works with all of our stakeholders and our external and internal users and they organize events, do the event planning, ensure that all of the logistical things are taken care of and the labs are set up properly. Um, and then our uh, boots on the ground simulation technicians are really the stars of the Sim Center. And so they're the ones that are in the center running the theater-based simulations. They're working with our faculty to develop and build models. They're setting up labs. They're doing teardown. Um, they're really using their creativity. Um, we also have a co-op and volunteer program. And so we have high school students that come in with us in usually grade 11 or 12 that are sometimes focused um, on the healthcare schism in Ontario anyways, um, as well as uh, university students who are looking to get into the medical field and they spend some time with us. The co-op students spend a whole semester with us for a half day and uh, university students usually dedicate about a four hour block per week to us in their busy academic schedule. Um, and so our sim techs really are the mentors for those co-op students and the volunteers. Um, and then we also have our administrative support who keep us on track and make sure that everything gets done. Wow, what a diverse cast of skills and, um, and, and, and training and expertise who are participating. Dr. Lavoie, did you want to add anything about the teaching and the directorships that Stephanie yeah. referenced? Um, so we have we have a number of educators so a lot of the people who are doing the educating are people who are working as healthcare professionals so we'll have respiratory therapists we'll have nurse we'll have our physicians who've gotten their training they've worked clinically they know where it is that people have to have that extra training so they go and get a little bit of extra um, education because we're, we're always hungry for education in our field and for more learning and then they come in and they they find ways to teach those skills so um, they can do everything from taking workshops to doing fellowships to even doing masters so once they've done all of their degrees and they're working clinically they go and get master's degree or fellowships to learn how to make sure that you teach in simulation in a way that is safe and enjoyable um, and in which our learners are, are going to be able to learn well. Fantastic. 
I see a lot of questions. There seems to be tons of curiosity about how to get into this. So I'm wondering if you could tell us about how you got into the role that you're in. Um, yeah, that'd be great. Um, yeah, I can I can talk a little bit about that and, and Steph can jump in. Um, there's a lot of ways to get into simulation. So if we're thinking about our, our simulation techs, our coordinator, our manager, a lot of them have gone into healthcare, but from so many different areas. So some of them became veterinary technicians. They became, um, you know, uh, imaging technicians. Some of them were respiratory therapists and they wanted to be able to do something a little different and a little bit more. Um, our doctors and nurses have gone through the, you know, kind of more traditional um, training that you do to become a healthcare professional, and then they got the bug because they went through simulation as learners. You have people like me where I'm not a clinician. I'm I'm actually have a PhD in psychology, so I was interested in how do people think, how do they learn. Um, I saw that there's a question around stress. I was very interested in how do healthcare professionals learn to manage the stress in these pretty scary situations at time. So I started doing a lot of work to try to study simulation and how do we do it? And how do we make sure that it's excellent? And through that, I ended up taking some leadership roles. So very kind of twisty and turny uh, ways to get into this field, I think is how many of us have found our way. Um, Steph, what would you say from your perspective? Yeah, so I started out um, the first time and I took marketing and business administration and I actually um, focused on my family a little bit and decided I was going to go back to school after and I became a cardiology technologist. Um, so I would do stress tests, Holter monitoring, ECGs, and um, I ended up working at the Ottawa Hospital in the eMERGE department um, doing ECGs. And um, to be honest, there was a position that came up in the simulation center and I didn't know a lot about it at the time. And um, it seemed like a great opportunity. So I had applied and I was successful. And um, the simulation bug that Dr. LeBlanc spoke about is exactly what bit me. And um, I absolutely loved it and decided that that's what I wanted to focus my career on. And here I am 11 years later. And um, so I started out at the Sim Center as a Sim Tech and then I moved into the coordinator role. Um, and I'm currently covering as the acting manager while our manager is um, away on a secondment doing COVID related things. So it's been uh, pretty exciting. And we have one of our techs to give you a different path. We had one of our techs that worked with us as a co-op student um, and then was a volunteer. Um, I think we think he's got interest in going into healthcare, but he wanted to take a bit of time to really develop his interest. So he's joined us this year um, as a simulation technician. We've hired him. So that's a job that he was able to step into because he did the co-op program and the volunteer program and really loved it and wants to spend some time doing that. And we're hoping he's going to go off and, and do his job in health here, but we're going to be very sorry to leave, see him leave as well, because he, for us, he's a big success story of, of being able to get in from, from high school. Absolutely. Such great stories of adaptability and also um, just busting through to seize opportunities um, and that resilience. So thank you for highlighting those, um, those anecdotes. I'm curious, you brought up, Stephanie, one of the ways that you've been impacted by COVID-19, which is um, changing roles because you're filling in for someone who's been um, drawn to another place. Can you talk a bit more, and this is a question that we saw about how COVID-19 has affected healthcare programs that you are both involved in? Maybe I'll let Dr. LeBlanc start with that one. Thank you. Yeah, how has, I mean, COVID was was massive, right? Because we, here we are, we, we have a, a disease that we don't know a lot about. Um, we have healthcare professionals that want to give the best care possible while still being able to protect themselves and their colleagues. Because if, if our doctors and nurses are sick, they're not gonna be able to take care for patients. So what we did pretty much for all of, of starting at the end of February to probably until May, was all about helping our healthcare professionals change how they're going to care for patients um, in, in COVID situations because they had to change what we call clinical protocols. They had to change the way they're coming into rooms um, and those aspects. Right now, we're working with the medical school and the residency programs to say, okay, if our med students can't get in to see the patients because they have to isolate, how do we use simulation to make up for that time? 
The other thing that our colleague uh, Glenn Posner did as well is he created videos. So these 3D videos that you can go and you can use it on your phone or move it around to help patients and say, okay, if you're somebody who's in labor and you're going to be coming to the hospital, here's what the experience is going to be like when you're coming in, right? Because it's scary for all of us if we have to go to the hospital in the best of times, but now we don't know how things are going to happen in COVID. So we're able to create those videos with our patient partners that are able to help the public know, okay, Hey, how are things going to be for my experience? And that takes some of that anxiety away from from having to go to the hospital in times that are, are, are pretty scary for all of us, right? So it's 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 illuminating to hear about this, and I, I continue to think I like reassuring also to know about all the thinking and the planning that's going on behind the scenes to make um, to make us all safe. So just to celebrate that. I'm just to back it up a bit and um, talk a bit more about these career tracks and um, pathways in education. See some questions about logistics. What can a grade nine student be doing now to best um, set them up to enter um, a medical uh, education track? And also, what does that track look like in terms of how long would they be in school? How long would a residency be? Um, yeah, I think so. I think what can be done at this point is, as Stephanie said, we have we have co-op programs in Ontario. We have something called Schism, um, that is a stream that allows um, learners in high school to be introduced to healthcare. Um, and a lot of simulation programs are interested in, in taking advantage of the co-op program where you can come in and spend some time. You can get to talk to healthcare workers who've done that path, find out the different ways to get in. So I think people that are interested is go talk to your teachers and, and ask if that's a possibility for a co-op program. Are they interested in reaching out to simulation programs? Um, your teachers are very welcome to reach out to us. We know a lot of the simulation programs across Canada that we would be happy to do introductions. Uh, for, for the right uh, individuals. Um, in terms of how long it takes, that's the way, you know, if you're going to do med school and residency and then you're going to do additional work, you know, the scary bit is after high school, you could be looking at 10 years of education, but it's not 10 years of sitting in school all the time, right? It's it's maybe a few years of sitting in school after you have your bachelor's degree, but then it, you're actually there as a, as a junior clinician, as a junior researcher. Thank you. So we're near the end of our time together thank you first of all for such practical and inspiring um, uh, contributions today and we're we're asking all of our panelists today what's some advice you would give a grade nine student or yourself in grade nine um, as as you look towards your future um, considering our audience today so yeah to um, each of you i would say find something that you love Find something that you love and, and you have a passion for because uh, sometimes things can be challenging. Um, and then, you know, don't be shy. Find out what are the things that I need to do. Talk to people who have those careers to get an idea of how that could align it. The other thing I would say is keep your options open, right? If we if we care too much, we have to focus and put energy in doing things. But if we put everything into just one thing and that doesn't happen, that can be heartbreaking. So my thing has always been, you know, have something you, you're passionate about and that you want to pursue, but have a plan B and a plan C that are almost as, as exciting um, and, and do a little bit of work for those plans so that, you know, if the first one doesn't work out, you kind of have something that you can do that you'll still be happy and 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 have sort of a, a an engaged career in front of you. Thank you. Stephanie, do you want to add anything? Just that I agree 100 percent. Do something that you really love and that you might not end up where you started and life takes turns and um, sometimes you end up just where you need to be. So. Amen. Thank you. What an amazing reminder of transferable skills and boundless potential um, and application uh, in numerous ways. Um, so thank you, Dr. LeBlanc and Stephanie. Thank you to everybody who's watching right now and especially for those fantastic questions. I hope we'll hear from you uh, to fill out that student survey, which is going to come via email. Enjoy the rest of your day.